Greetings, denizens of the Empire. It's Jabara here. The final episode of this year's Black History series will be a little different. As I've mentioned earlier, in our education system, Black history tends to focus entirely on the highlights of oppression and subsequent freedom against European or white men. The intent of this series, and from nothing as a whole, is to show that we don't come from nothing. In other words, our history started long before any of the oppression that our people faced in these new lands to the West. However, history isn't always pretty, and at times I have and will continue to mention the bad parts when necessary, and today is one of those days. While we tend to put most of our focus on North American slavery, the majority of the transatlantic slave trade took place in Latin America and the Caribbean, and continued for a much longer period of time. So today, I will be sharing a documentary created by ethno filmmakers. The link to their channel can be found below. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Happy Hippo Herbals for sponsoring this video. Kratom is an alternative medicine that I had the privilege of trying out for the very first time courtesy of Happy Hippo Herbals and I have to say I'm very grateful to have it introduced into my life. Kratom is a plant native to Southeast Asia and has been used by indigenous peoples of the region for centuries. After trying it out for myself, the best way I can describe its effect on me is a combination of feeling relaxed and mellow all the while feeling focused and energetic. Similar to the interject effects of coffee or tea, except feeling generally calm and content at the same time, and without crashing or feeling dehydrated afterwards. I pretty much just stop focusing on problems, have a general sense of well-being, and just overall happy vibes without feeling overwhelmed. It's exactly what I need when I'm tirelessly conducting research for new content and editing my videos. Bear in mind, however, that Kratom is a lifestyle product that is unregulated by the FDA, so it's important to do your own research about the benefits and the risks. So, just like anything else, controlling portions and being responsible are really all there is to it. I can confidently tell you, however, that it works great for me and I highly recommend it. You can receive a 15% discount on all Happy Hippo Herbals products using my referral link down below or my coupon code FN10 at checkout. It'll definitely help to bring some positivity into your life, all the while helping support my channel. So anyway, back to the video. Perhaps many of you here are not acquainted with the subject of slavery. I will therefore explain to you what it is. First, let us imagine a child to have been born of slave parents. Poor, unfortunate child. From that very day, his birthday, he is considered and classed as a brute. 
from that very day he becomes property, the property of a master who may sell him and do with him what he pleases. The reality of our historical past, particularly with regard to slavery, is a hideous legacy of one of history's most tragic events, the birth of the Africa to America, transatlantic slave trade. Many of us know that the colonialization and development of the Americas, North, Central, and South America, depended heavily upon the transatlantic trade in human trafficking. We also know that in every European empire in the Americas, it was enslaved Africans and indigenous Indians that produced all significant exports for centuries. Also, we know that the foundations of the Atlantic slave trade have been studied by scholars the world over for decades, including the origins and demographic composition of both the indigenous Indian and African populations. The origins and beginnings of the Atlantic slave trade have been very much overlooked, and only within the past 40 years or so have details about the motivations behind the trade been revealed. A large amount of evidence concerning voyages along the Middle Passage still exists. Mostly, it is found in the form of letters, diaries, memoirs, captain's log books, and shipping company records. Recently, we have learned a great deal more about the transatlantic slave trade, and we know now that about 12 and a half million Africans were removed from Africa, with more than 2 million of them arriving in the Spanish Americas. The thing that distinguishes slavery in Africa from Atlantic slavery is race. Europeans set in motion a system of slavery that was predicated on the idea that certain people were marked as enslavable. Not only did the Spanish Empire play an important role in the Americas, but the Spanish colonies have a much broader history than their British, French, Dutch, or Portuguese counterparts. The Spanish involvement in the trade was so great, it impacted all other European countries involved in the trade. It took captives from almost all African slave regions, 
orchestrated and transported enslaved Africans to almost all of the American colonies. Not only was it a major source of African slaves in the overseas transatlantic trade, but it also dominated in the intra-American traffic that later became a primary source of slaves. During this period, Spain was an enormous global power whose link between economics and slavery made it the most important political entity in the Americas, with political decrees within the Spanish court, assisted by religious edicts by the Catholic Church, the slave trade expanded and prospered. The kingdoms of Portugal and Spain had been posturing for possession of the African coast and colonial territories for more than a century. Believing that the Catholic Church could resolve these disputes, each sought and obtained papal bulls to support its claims. In the mid-15th century, the Pope gave the Portuguese the right to explore Africa. Later, he gave them the right to enslave anyone who was not practicing the Christian religion. This was done with the papal bull Dum Diversus in 1452. This papal bull authorized the enslavement of Muslims, pagans, and other non-Christians, while the Romanus, Pontifex, and the Inta Cajiteja laid the foundations for mercantilism and the transatlantic slave trade. The papal bull Romanus Pontifex, 1455, is an important example of the papacy's claim to spiritual lordship of the whole world and of its role in regulating relations between Christians and non-Christians. In the long struggle between Portugal and Spain, this was an important decree because it settled the matter in favor of Portugal. Portugal's claim to lands in the New World was based on this bull. However, the bull Inter Caeterra, 1493, was highly favorable to Spain. This revised bull drew a line of demarcation and assigned to Spain the exclusive right to acquire territorial possessions west of the line. But crucial to this bull was that all persons were forbidden to approach the lands west of the line without special license and consent from the Royal Court of Spain. The Spanish Empire was one of the first European empires to actually unify politics and religion. Spanish Jews were forced to convert to Catholicism, and those that did not convert were arrested, imprisoned, or executed. Later, an edict was declared that Moors must convert to Catholicism or be exiled. Under the rule of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, the slave trade in Spain was closely regulated and controlled. Laws existed concerning the sources of slaves, their conditions, and possible liberation. However, it was Queen Isabella who also approved the edict entitled La Encomienda, a system that started the practice of forced unpaid slavery upon indigenous peoples. Originally, the encomienda system was a method of rewarding soldiers and financial backers who fought against and helped conquer the Moors before they were exiled. This right was formally protected by the Spanish crown and permitted encomienderos to extract free labor and tribute from conquered people who were considered vassals of the crown. In turn, these soldiers and financial backers were required to ensure 
that natives were given instruction in the Catholic faith, the Spanish language, and protected from other warring tribes and pirates. The Spanish crown awarded these licenses as a grant to particular individuals. It was held as a monopoly on the labor of particular groups of indigenous people and was in perpetuity to the holder and his or her descendants. In many cases, natives were forced to do hard labor and subjected to extreme punishment and death if they resisted. Later, the Spanish crown reformed the encomienda laws, restricting the holding of the grant to only two generations instead of perpetuity. When the crown tried to implement the policy, Spanish landholders rebelled against the crown. When Charles V became the king of Spain, he inherited an enormous empire that was beset with many external as well as internal problems. The collection of both his European and American territories was enormously vast. His inheritance included the realms of Austria and Spain, the Netherlands, French Burgundy, dominions of the Holy Roman Empire from Germany to Northern Italy, and the Southern Italian kingdoms of Naples, Sicily, and Sardinia. Charles was born the son of Maximilian I of the Austrian House of Habsburg and Joanna of the Spanish House of Trastamare, the daughter of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain. Almost from the very beginning, Charles's reign was embroiled defending his kingdoms on the European continent and expanding his territories in the Americas. With wars being a costly endeavor, Charles was forced to borrow considerable sums of money from German and Italian bankers. In order to repay such loans, he depended heavily upon an emerging capitalist economy of cash flows from his low countries and the flows of precious metals from South America to Spain, which were the chief source of his wealth. Charles V received a Spanish inheritance that consisted of the union of the crowns of Castile, Queen Isabella, and Aragon, King Ferdinand. However, as a native-born Habsburg from Austria, he was viewed by Spanish aristocracy and nobles as a foreign ruler. Charles was accepted as sovereign, but the Spanish were very uneasy with his imperial style. Soon, resistance to his reign began, especially because of heavy taxation to support foreign wars, which the Castilians had very little interest in, and because he tended to select Flemings for high government offices in Castile and America, ignoring Spanish or Castilian candidates. Later, two rebellions. The revolt of the Germanies and the revolt of the Comaneros contested Charles' rule. The Spanish Council of State was made up of seven Flemings and just two Castilians. Laurent G. Gouverneau was a Flemish aristocrat with a very high position in the Spanish court. Before 1518, the slave trade was highly regulated and consisted mostly of slaves being sent from Spain to the Americas, directly by the Spanish government. However, Charles V opened the transatlantic slave trade on a massive scale when in August 1518, he granted a charter to Laurent G. Gouverneau to transport 4,000 slaves directly from Africa to the Spanish-American colonies. In effect, Charles V was circumventing the legal statutes established by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella that slaves must have been born in Spain and they only allow Africans to enter the Americas provided they had converted to Catholicism. 
Gouverneur's license provided for the trafficking of 4,000 male and female slaves. Although it was specified that the shipment should take place at the port of Seville, where it would be exempt from the obligation to register with the Casa G. Contrata Sound, which would guarantee that no more licenses would be granted for the following eight years, Gouverneur resold his license to Genoese merchants, who in turn sold their rights to other traffickers. The enormous budget deficit that Charles accumulated during his reign, due to foreign wars and conflicts, along with the inflation that affected the kingdom, influenced his decision to create a more direct, economically viable, Africa to America slave trade. This decision by Charles V essentially changed the nature and scale of the transatlantic slave trade for centuries. The Middle Passage was the middle leg of a voyage that starts in Europe. The first passage is from Europe to Africa. The Middle Passage is the journey from Africa to America. And then the third passage is the journey back from America to Europe. For African slave traders, it was important to capture the youngest and healthiest Africans because their chances of surviving the voyage across the Middle Passage were greater. Enslaved Africans were sometimes captured some distance inland, and slave traders used small boats to carry them down rivers to the coast. When rivers were not accessible or boats not available, enslaved Africans made the journey to the coast on foot. Africans endured a long journey to the coast chained together in kofos of anywhere from 10 or 20 to as many as a thousand or more. Once at the coast, enslaved Africans were imprisoned in dark slave pens, West African slave castles, or makeshift pens constructed on the beaches. By the end of the 17th century, European shipbuilders began making ships, especially for the Atlantic slave trade. These ships were constructed with extra portholes for ventilation and areas to mount weapons on deck in the event of rebellions. Additional compartments below the deck for extra cargo and netting around the ship to catch enslaved Africans that were inclined to throw themselves overboard. Slaves were densely packed onto these vessels for a voyage that took two to three months. Mostly, they were laid on the floor of the cargo hold in rows or on shelves that ran along the walls. The space allowed for these shelves made it impossible for them to stand. At last, when the ship we were in had got in all her cargo, they made ready with many fearful noises, and we were all put under deck so that we could not see how they managed the vessel. But this disappointment was the least of my sorrow. The stench of the hold while we were on the coast was so intolerably loathsome that it was dangerous to remain there for any time, and some of us had been permitted to stay on the deck for the fresh air. But now that the whole ship's cargo were confined together, it became absolutely pestilential. The closeness of the place and the heat of the climate added to the number in the ship, which was so crowded that each had scarcely room to turn himself, almost suffocated us. 
This produced copious perspirations, so that the air soon became unfit for respiration from a variety of loathsome smells and brought on a sickness among the slaves, of which many died, thus falling victims to the improvident avarice, as I may call it, of their purchasers. You're talking about hundreds of people. You're at 120 degrees. It smells terrible. There are actually people dying around you, which has to be a traumatic experience for everybody on board. Never having seen such huge ships before, enslaved Africans were both frightened and awed as they were slowly paddled out to the slave ships. A week or so after leaving the African coast, chances for effective escape were lessened and small groups of enslaved Africans were brought on deck to be inspected. Food rations were very small, and often the spoilage of food, particularly water, was responsible for countless outbreaks of dysentery. The living conditions for enslaved Africans were appalling, and as a result of the bacterially infested conditions, untold numbers of slaves died from disease. One of the most horrendous aspects of the voyage was the inhumane treatment, vicious brutality, and complete disregard for the lives of enslaved Africans. Histories of the transatlantic slave trade typically focus on those enslaved in the North American colonies and often overlook its southern counterpart. However, slave imports from Africa were overwhelmingly taken to the Caribbean and South America. After the conquest of Latin America by the Spanish and Portuguese, over four million enslaved Africans were taken to Brazil via the Atlantic slave trade, with the majority of Africans being placed in the South American Spanish and Portuguese colonies, they slowly transformed the societies where they were enslaved. As a result of multicultural relationships, there were many different racial mixtures derived from the offspring of various unions between Spaniards, indigenous peoples, the Portuguese, and enslaved Africans, producing a fluidity and pliability of racial identity that became a defining characteristic of Latin American colonialism. The large Afro-Latino populations, which remain in these regions today, are the legacy of colonial slavery. Colombia was a major destination for slave ships, with the town of Cartagena de Indias being one of the most important ports through which enslaved Africans entered Nueva Granada, present-day Colombia and Panama, as well as parts of Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, Costa Rica, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Cartagena also served as a hub for the intra-Latin American slave trade, where enslaved Africans were sold on to various destinations in the Andes and beyond. Within Colombia, enslaved Africans carried out a wide variety of tasks. They were squires, muleteers, cowboys, blacksmiths, domestic servants, gold miners, pearl divers, and sugarcane cultivators. The relatively slow economic growth and development in Colombia is believed to have contributed to an overall less harsh and exploitative forms of slavery in many parts of Colombia than in the French and English 
sugar islands. Of course, this idea is debated, but it appears that the dehumanization of enslaved Africans was less pronounced in Spanish America than in French and British colonies. In Colombia, a slave was able and allowed to testify against their master in court on matters of maltreatment and other legalities, and often did so. It is also argued that Colombian authorities and slave owners were more readily able to accept enslaved Africans as human beings, not as equals, of course, but with some basic human rights. Becoming a freed man was a legitimate goal for enslaved Africans who could gain their freedom through a variety of means and through the influence of the Catholic Church. Also, family bonds among enslaved Africans were encouraged. Up to two-thirds of all adult enslaved Africans in Colombia lived in family units and parents had rights over the fate of their children. When a sale occurred, it was more often than not the sale of an entire family. As in other parts of South America, the indigenous population of the Bolivian Andes decreased dramatically. To compensate for the loss of indigenous labor, African slaves were transported in great numbers to Potosi. Potosi was a fabulous wealth mining town that became one of the richest and largest cities in South America. There, enslaved Africans were forced to act as human mules. Unfortunately, the lifespan of a human mule was only two months. The vice royalty of the Rio de la Plata or River of Silver was the last to be organized and also the shortest lived of the vice royalties of the Spanish Empire in the Americas. The vice royalty was established from several former vice royalty of Peru dependencies, representing the territories of Argentina, Chile, Bolivia, Paraguay, Uruguay, and extending inland from the Atlantic coast. The first slaves arrived in Buenos Aires from Brazil, and more than 70% of the value of all imports arriving in Buenos Aires were enslaved Africans. Enslaved Africans came primarily from Brazil via the Portuguese slave trade from Angola and other Western states in Africa. Upon arriving in Buenos Aires, they could be sent as far as Peru, Chile, Paraguay, Bolivia, and southern Peru. Africans resisted and defied enslavement with great intensity. As in other regions of the Americas, African slavery in the region was synonymous with escape and flight. Also, the terrain made escape a viable option and the vast territories were impossible for slave owners and authorities to fully monitor. Several rebellions inspired by indigenous and mestizo populations, in addition to attempts by the Portuguese and British to conquer the region, proved counterproductive to security and the slave trade. When Buenos Aires called for independence and began the wars of independence, they eventually spread across all Latin America, and the participation of slaves was crucial to victory. Finally, when the Criollo elite re revolted against colonial authorities, a revolution spread across the entire Viceroyalty as far north as Peru. Following a two-year siege, the Viceroyalty was finished as government of the region. Because of the brave efforts of enslaved Africans on the battlefield, gradual abolition was introduced and the first constitution of Argentina abolished slavery completely in 1853. 
Between the 1490s and the 1850s, Latin America, including the Spanish-speaking Caribbean and Brazil, imported the largest number of African slaves to the New World, generating the single greatest concentration of African populations outside of the African continent. This pivotal moment in the transfer of African peoples was also a transformational time during which the interrelationships among Africans, indigenous Americans, and whites produced the essential cultural and demographic framework that would define the region even until today. But what distinguishes colonial Latin American slavery from other places in the Western Hemisphere is the degree to which the African experience was defined not just by slavery, but also by opportunities to obtain freedom. By the late 18th century, there were over a million Africans and mulattoes in the region. They were freedmen and women, exercising a tremendously wide variety of roles in their respective societies. Even within the framework of slavery, Latin America presents a special case, particularly on the mainland. The forces of the market economy, the design of social hierarchies, the impact of Iberian legal codes, the influence of Catholicism, the demographic impact of indigenous Americans, and the presence of a substantial mixed race population provided a context for slavery that would dictate a different course for African life than anywhere else in the Americas. I hope you all enjoyed the video, thanks for watching as usual, and always remember, we don't come from nothing.